All right. Oops. Having a sand bomb might be nice. All right. So minus camera issues I'm having. It's good enough. I've been fussing with it. Not enough light today. All right. So we're starting Malleus Maleficorum, the Witch Hammer. Get through half of the first part today. Uh, as usual, I'm not going to read the introduction from the translator, or introductions in this case, because there's two. Um, so we're going to begin, jump right in to the Malleus Maleficorum. See how far we get. Right. Part one, question one. Whether the belief that there are such beings as witches is so essential a part of the Catholic faith that obstinacy to maintain the opposite opinion manifestly savors of heresy. Whether the belief that there are such beings as witches is so essential a part of the Catholic faith that obstinately to maintain the opposite opinion manifestly savors of heresy, and it argued that a firm belief in witches is not a Catholic doctrine. See chapter 26, question 5 of the work of Episcopus. Whoever believes that any creature can be changed for the better or worse, or the worse, or transformed into another kind or likeness, except by the creator of all things, is worse than a pagan and a heretic. And so when they report such things are done by witches, it is not Catholic, but plainly heretical to maintain this opinion. Moreover, no operation of witchcraft has a permanent effect among us, and this is the proof thereof. For if it were so, it would be affected by the operation of demons. But to maintain that the devil has power to change human bodies or to do them permanent harm does not seem in accordance with the teaching of the church. For in this way they could destroy the whole world and bring it to utter confusion. Moreover, every alteration, alteration that takes place in a human body, for example, a state of health or a state of sickness, can be brought down to a question of natural causes, as Aristotle has shown in his seventh book of physics. And the greatest of these is the influence of the stars. But the devils cannot interfere with the stars. This is the opinion of Di Dionysius in his epistle of S. Polycarp. For this alone God can do. Therefore, it is evident the demons cannot actually effect any permanent transformation in human bodies. That is to say, no real metamorphosis. And so we must refer the appearance of any such change to some dark and occult cause. And the power of God is stronger than the power of the devil, so divine works are more true than de demoniac operations. Whence inasmuch as evil is powerful in the world, then it must be the work of the devil always conflicting with the work of God. Therefore, as it is unlawful to hold that the devil's evil craft can apparently exceed the work of God, so it is unlawful to believe that the noblest work of creation, that is to say, man and beast, can be harmed and spoiled by the power of the devil. Moreover, that which is under the influence of a material object cannot have power over a corporeal objects. But devils are subservient to certain influences of the stars, because magicians observe the course of certain stars in order to evoke the devils. Therefore, they have not the power of effecting any change in corporeal object, and it follows that witches have even less power than the demons possess. For the devils have no power at all save by a certain subtle art, but an art cannot permanently produce a true form. And a certain author says, writers on alchemy know that there is no hope of any real transmutation. Therefore, the devils for their part, making use of the utmost of their craft, cannot bring about any permanent cure or permanent disease. But if these states exist, it is in truth owing to some other cause, which may be unknown and has nothing to do with the operations of either devils or witches. But according to the decret, uh, Decretals 33, the contrary is the case. 
If by witchcraft or any magic art permitted by the secret by most just will of God and aided by the power of the devil, etc. The reference here is to any act of witchcraft which may hinder the end of marriage and for this impediment to, to take effect three things can concur. That is to say, witchcraft, the devil, and the permission of God. Moreover, the stronger can influence that which is less strong, but the power of the devil is stronger than any human power. Javix 1. There is no power upon earth which can be compared to him who was created so that he fears none. Yeah. Hey, Liz. <laughs> Yeah, the camera was in, so we're just dealing with it. Okay, where are we? Answer. Here are three heretical errors which must be met, and when they have been disproved, the truth will be plain. For certain writers pretending to base their opinion upon the word of St. Saint Th Saint Thomas, when he treats of impediments brought about by magic charms have tried to maintain that there is not such a thing as magic, that it only exists in the imagination of those men who ascribe natural effects, the cause of whereof are not known, to witchcraft and spells. There are others who acknowledge indeed that witches exist, but they declare that the influence of magic and the effects of charms are purely imaginary and phantasmical. A third class of writers maintain that the effects said to be wrought by magic spells are altogether illusory and fanciful, although it may be that the devil doesn't re does really lend his aid to some witch. Yeah. The errors held by each one of these persons may thus be set forth and thus confuted, for in the very first place they are shown to be plainly heretical by many orthodox writers and especially by St. Thomas, who lays down that such an opinion is altogether contrary to the authority of the saints and is founded upon absolute infidelity. Because the authority of the Holy Scripture says that devils have power over the bodies and over the minds of men, when God allows them to exercise this power, as is plain from very many passages in the Holy Scriptures, therefore those err who say that there is no such thing as witchcraft, but that it is purely imaginary, even although they do not believe that devils exist, except in the imagination of the ignorant and vulgar, in the natural accidents which happen to a man he wrongly attributes to some supposed devil. For the imagination of some men is so vivid that they think they see actual figures and appearances which are but the reflection of their, their thoughts, and then these are believed to be the app apparitions of evil spirits or even the specters of witches. But this is contrary to the true faith, which teaches us that certain angels fell from heaven and are now devils, and we are bound to acknowledge that by their very nature they can do many wonderful things which we cannot do, and those who try to induce others to perform such evil wonders are called witches, and because infidelity in a person who has been baptized is technically called heresy, therefore such persons are plainly heretics. Is there something wrong with it? Hold on. Okay, is it good now? Let me try it. I didn't change anything, so. Hold on. You just have two windows open? Hmm. Alright. Alright, tell me if anything's, if it's continuing to be a problem. Thank you, Liz. As regards those who hold the other two errors, those that is to say, who do not deny that there are demons and that demons possess a natural power, but who differ among themselves concerning the possible effects of magic and the possible operations of witches, the one school holding that a witch can truly bring about certain effects 
Yet these effects are not real, but fantastical. The other school allowing that some real harm does befall the person or persons injured. But that when a witch imagines this damages the effect of her arts, she is grossly deceived. This error seems to be based upon two passage, passages from the canons, where certain women are condemned who falsely imagine that during the night they ride abroad with Diana or Herodias. This may read in the canon, but yet, yet because such things often happen by illusion or merely in the imagination, those who suppose that all the effects of witchcraft are mere illusion and imagination are very greatly deceived. Secondly, with regard to a man who believes or maintains that a creature can be made or changed, for better or for worse, or transformed into some other kind of or likeness, by anyone saved by God, the creator of all things alone, is an infidel and worse than a heathen. Wherefore, on account of these words, changed for the worse, they say that such an effect, if wrought by witchcraft, cannot be real, but must be purely fantastical. But inasmuch as these errors savor of heresy and contradict the obvious meaning of the canon, we will first prove our point by the divine law, as also by ecclesiastical and civil law, and first in general. Hey Rupu, hey Sabu. To commence, the expressions of the canon must be treated of in detail, although the sense of the canon will be even more clearly elucidated in the following question. For the divine, in many places, commands that witches are not only to be avoided, but also they are to be put to death, and it would not impose the extreme penalty of this kind if only witches did not really and truly make a compact with devils, in order to bring about real and true hurts and harms. For the penalty of death is not inflicted except for some grave and notorious crime, but it is otherwise with death of the soul, which can be brought about by the power of a fantastical illusion, or even by the stress of temptation. This is the opinion of St. Thomas when he discusses whether it be evil to make us make use of the help of devils. For in the 18th chapter of Deuteronomy, it is commanded that all wizards and charmers are to be destroyed. Also, the 19th chapter of Leviticus says, The soul which goeth to wizards and soothsayers to commit fornication with them, I will set my face against that soul and destroy it out of the midst of my people. And again, a man or woman in whom there is a pythonical or divining spirit spirit dying, let them die, they shall stone them. Those persons are said to be pythons, in whom the devil works extraordinary things. Moreover, this must be borne in mind that on account of this sin, Ecosius fell sick and died. 4. Kings 1, also Saul 1, Parlipomenum 10. We have, moreover, the weighty opinions of the fathers who have written upon the scriptures and who have treated at length of the power of demons and of magic arts. The writings of many doctors upon book two of the sentences may be consulted, and it will be found that they are all agree that there are wizards and sorcerers who by the power of the devil can pr produce real and extraordinary effects, and these effects are not imaginary, and God permits this to be. I will not mention those very many other places where St. Thomas in great detail discusses operations of this kind, as, for example, in his Summa Contra Gentiles, Book 3, Chapters 1 and 2, in Part 1, Question 114, Argument 4, and in the second of the second questions, 92 and 94. We may further consult the commentators and the exegetes, who have written upon the wise men and magicians of Pharaoh, Exodus 7. We may also consult what St. Augustine says in the City of God, Book 18, Chapter 17. See further his second book on Christian doctrine. Very many of these doctors advance the same opinion, and it would be the height of folly for any man to contradict all these, and he could not be held to clear of, to be clear of the guilt of heresy. For any man who gravely errs, 
in an exposition of Holy Scripture is rightly considered to be a heretic, and whosoever thinks otherwise concerning these matters which touch the faith that the Holy Roman Church holds is a heretic, there is that faith. <laughs> Maybe I'll do some some children's bedtime stories for you, huh? All right. Question two: If it be in accordance with the Catholic faith to maintain that in order to bring about some effect of magic, the devil may must intimately cooperate with the witch or whether one without the other, that is to say, the devil without the witch, or conversely, could produce such an effect. And the first argument is this, that the devil can bring about an effect of magic without the cooperation of any witch. So St. Augustine holds, All things which visibly happen, so that they can be seen, may, it is believed, be the work of the inferior powers of the air, but bodily ills and ailments are certainly not invisible, nay, rather, they are evident to the senses. Therefore, they can be brought about by devils. Moreover, we learn from the holy scriptures of the disasters which fell upon Job, how fire fell from heaven and striking the sheep and the servants consumed them, and how a violent wind threw down the four corners of a house, so that it fell upon his children and slew them all. The devil by himself, without the cooperation of any witches, but merely be, by God's permission alone, was able to bring about all these disasters. Therefore he can certainly do many things which are often ascribed to the work of witches. And this is obvious from the account of the seven husbands of the maiden Sarah, whom a devil killed. Moreover, whatever a superior power is able to do, it is able to do without reference to a power superior, superior to it. And a superior power can all the more work without reference to an inferior power. But an inferior power can cause hailstorms and bring about diseases without the help of a power greater than it itself. For blessed Albertus Magnus and his work, De, De Passionibus Aries, says the rotten sage, if used as he explains and thrown into running water, will arouse most fearful tempests and storms. Moreover, it may be said that the devil makes us of a witch, not because he ha has need of any such agent, but because he is seeking the perdition of the witch. We may refer to what Aristotle says in the third book of his Ethics. Evil is a voluntary act, which is proved by the fact that nobody performs an unjust action, and a man who commits a rape does this for the sake of pleasure, not merely doing evil for evil's sake. Yet the law punishes those who have done evil as if they had acted merely for the sake of doing evil. Therefore, if the devil works by means of a witch, he is merely employing an instrument, and since an instrument depends upon the will of the person, who employs it, and does not act of its own free will, therefore the guilt of the action ought not to be laid to the charge of the witch, and in consequence she should not be punished. No, I haven't, Rufu. Will soon. i gotta, I got to find some. But an opposite opinion holds that the devil cannot so easily and readily do harm by himself to mankind, as he can harm them through the instrumentality of witches, although they are his servants. In the first place, we may consider the act of, a, of generation, but for every act which has an effect upon another, some kind of contact must be established. And because the devil, who is a spirit, can have no such actual contact with the human body, since there is nothing common of this kind between them, therefore he uses some human instruments, and upon these he bestows the power of hurting by bodily touch. And many hold, hold this to be proven by the text, and the gloss upon the text, in the third chapter of St. Paul's epistle to the Galatians. O senseless Galatians, who hath bewitched you that you should not obey the truth? And the gloss upon the passage refers to those who have singularly fiery and baleful eyes, who by a mere look can harm others, especially young children. And Avicenna also bears this out, Naturalism Book 3, chap chapter the last, when he says, 
Very often the soul may have in it as much influence upon the body of another to the same extent as it has upon its own body. For such is the influence of the eyes of any one who by his glance attracts and fascinates another. And the same opinion is maintained by Al-Ghazali in the fifth book and tenth chapter of his Physics. Avicenna also suggests although he does not put this opinion forward as irrefutable, that the power of the imagination can actually change or seem to change extraneous bodies. In cases where the power of the imagination is too unrestrained, and hence we father that the, that the power of imagination is not to be considered as distinct from a man's other sensible powers, since it is common to them all, but to some extent it includes all those other powers. And this is true, because such a power of the imagination can change adjacent bodies. As, for example, when a man is able to walk along some narrow beam which is stretched down the middle of a street. But yet, if this beam were suspended over deep water, he would not dare to walk along it, because his imagination would most strongly impress upon his mind the idea of falling, and therefore his body and the power of his limbs would not obey his imagination, and they would not obey the contrary thereto, that is to say, walking directly and without hesitation. This change may be compared to the influence exercised by the eyes of a person who has such influence and so a mental change is brought about although there is not any actual and bodily change. Moreover, if it be argued that such change is the cause by a living body owing to the influence of the mind upon some other living body, this answer may be given. In the presence of a murderer, blood flows from the wounds in the corpse of the person he is slain. Therefore, without any mental powers, bodies can produce wonderful effects. And so a living man, if he pass by near the corpse of a murdered man, although he may not be aware of the dead body, is often seized with fear. Again, there are some things in nature which have certain hidden powers, the reason for which does not know. Man does not know. Such, for example, is the lodestone, which attracts steel and many other such things, which St. Augustine mentions in the 20th book of the City of God. And so women, in order to bring about changes in the bodies of others, sometimes make use of certain things which exceed our knowledge, but this is without any aid from the devil. And because the re these remedies are mysterious, we must not therefore ascribe them to the power of the devil, as we should ascribe evil spells wrought by witches. Moreover, witches use certain images and other strange periphs, which they are wont to place under the lintels of the doors of houses, or in the, those meadows where flocks are herding, or even the, where men congregate, and thus they cast spells over their victims, who have oft times been known to die. But because such extraordinary effects can proceed from these images, it would appear that the influence of these images is in proportion to the influence of the stars over the human bodies. For as natural bodies are influenced by heavenly bodies, so many may artificial bodies likewise be thus influenced. But natural bodies may find the benefit of certain secret but good influences. Therefore, artificial bodies may receive such influence. Hence, it is plain that those who perform works of healing may well perform them by means of such good influences, and this has no connection at all with any evil power. I believe so, Liz. I'll have to look that up. Moreover, it would seem that most extraordinary and miraculous events come to pass by the working of the power of nature. For wonderful and terrible and amazing things happen owing to natural forces. And this St. Gregory points out in his second dialogue. The saint performs miracles, sometimes by a prayer, sometimes by their power alone. There are examples of each. St. Peter, Peter, by praying, raised to life Tabitha, who was dead by rebuking An Ananias and Sapphira, who were telling a lie, he slew the without, them without any prayer. Therefore, a man by his mental influence can change a material body into another, or he can change such a body 
from health to sickness and conversely. Moreover, the human body is nobler than any other body, but because of the passions of the mind, the human body changes and becomes hot or cold, as is the case with angry men or men who are afraid, and so even greater change takes place with regard to the effects of sickness and death, which by their power can greatly change a material body. But certain objections must be allowed. The influence of the mind cannot make an impression upon any form except by the intervention of some agent, as we have said above. And these are the words of St. Augustine in the book which we have already quoted. It is incredible that the angels who fell from heaven should be obedient to any material things, for they, uh, for they obey God only. And much less can a man of his natural power bring about extraordinary and evil effects. The answer must be made. There are even today many who err greatly on this point, making excuses for witches and laying the whole blame upon the craft of the devil, or ascribing the changes that they work to some natural alteration. These errors may be easily made clear, first by the description of witches, which St. Isidore gives in his Etymologies, chapter 9, witches are so called on account of the blackness of their guilt, that is to say, their deeds are more evil than those of any mal other malefactors. He continues, They stir up and confound the elements by the aid of the devil, and arouse terrible hailstorms and tempests. Moreover, he says, they distract the minds of men, driving them to madness, insane hatred, and inordinate lusts. Again, he continues, by the terrible influence of their spells alone, as it were by a draught of poison, they can destroy life. And the words of St. Augustine in his book on the city of God are very much to the point, for he tells us who magicians and witches really are. Magicians, who are commonly called witches, are thus termed on account of the magnitude of their evil deeds. These are they who, by the permission of God, disturb the elements, who drive to distraction the minds of men, such as, such as have lost their trust in God, and by the terrible power of their evil spells, without any actual draught or poison, kill human beings. As Lucan says, a mind which has only been corrupted by any noxious drink perishes for spoken by some evil charm. For having summoned devils to their aid, they actually dare to heap harm upon mankind, and even to destroy their enemies by their evil spells. And it is certain that in operations of this kind, the witch works in close conjunction with the devil. Secondly, punishments are of four kinds, beneficial, hurtful, wrought by witchcraft, and natural. Beneficial punishments are meted out by the ministry of good angels, just as hurtful punishments proceed from evil spirits. Moses smote Egypt with ten plagues by the ministry of good angels, and the magicians were only able to perform three of these miracles by the aid of the devil. And the pestilence which fell upon the people for three days because of the sin of David, who numbered the pe people in the 72,000 men who were slain in one night in the army of Sennacherib were miracles wrought by the angels of God, that is, by good angels who feared God and knew that they were carrying out his commands. Destructive harm, however, is wrought by the medium of bad angels, at whose hand, hands the children of Israel in the desert were often afflicted, and those, who, those harms, which are simply evil and nothing more, are brought about by the devil, who works through the medium of sorcerers and witches. There are also natural harms which in some manner depend upon the conjunction of heavenly bodies such as dearth, drought, tempests, and similar effects of nature. It is obvious that there is a vast difference between all these causes, circumstances, and happenings. For Job was afflicted by the devil with a harmful disease, but this is nothing to the purpose and if anybody who is too, too clever and over-curious asks how it was that Job was afflicted with the disease by the devil without the aid of some sorcerer or witch, let him know that he is merely beating the air and not informing himself as to the real truth. For in the time of Job there were no sorcerers and witches, and such abominations were not yet practiced. But the providence of God which that 
by the example of Job, the power of the devil, even over good men, might be manifested, so that we might learn to be on our guard against Satan, and moreover, by the example of his holy, this holy patriarch, the glory of God shines abroad, since nothing happens save what is permitted by God. Excuse me. Question 3. Whether children can be generated by incubi and succubi? At first, it may truly seem that it is not in accordance with the Catholic faith to maintain that children can be begotten by devils, that is to say, by incubi and succubi. For God himself, before sin came into the world, instituted human procreation. Since he created women, woman from the rib of man, to be a help me unto man. And to them he said, Increase and multiply. Genesis 2.24 Likewise, after sin had come into the world, it was said to know, know we, Increase and multiply. Genesis, Genesis 9.1 In the time of the new law also, Christ confirmed this union. Have you not read that he who made man from the beginning made them male and female? Therefore, men cannot be begotten in any other way than this. But it may be argued that devils take their part in this generation, not as, essential, as the essential cause, but as a secondary and artificial cause, since they busy themselves by interfering with the process of normal copulation and conception, by obtaining human semen, and themselves transferring it. Objection. The devil can perform this act in every state of life, that is to say, in the matrimonial state or not in the matrimonial state. Now he cannot perform it in the first state, because then the act of the devil would be more powerful than the act of God, who instituted and confirmed this holy estate, since it is a state of con continence and wedlock. Nor can he affect this in any other estate, since we never read in Scripture that children can be begotten in one state and not in another. Moreover, to beget a child in the act of a living body, but devils cannot bestow life upon the bodies which they assume, because life formally only proceeds from the soul, and the act of generation is the act of physical organs which have bodily life. Therefore, bodies which are assumed in this way cannot either beget or bear. Yet it may be said that these devils assume a body, not in order that they may bestow, bestow life upon it, but that they may, by the means of this body, preserve human semen and pass the semen on to another body. Objection. As in the action of angels, whether they be good or bad, there is nothing superfluous and useless, nor is there anything superfluous and useless in nature. But the devil, by his natural power, which is far greater than any human bodily power, can perform any spiritual action and perform it again and again, although man may not be able to discern it. Therefore, he is able to perform this action, although man may not be able to discern when the devil is concerned therewith. For all bodily and material things are on a lower scale than pure and spiritual intelligences. But the angels, whether they be good or whether they be evil, are pure and spiritual intelligences. Therefore, they can control what is below them. Therefore, the devil can collect and make use as he will of human semen, which belongs to the body. However, to collect human semen from one person and transfer it to another implies certain local actions. But devils cannot locally move bodies from place to place. And this is the argument they put forward. The soul is purely a spiritual essence, so is the devil. But the soul cannot move a body from place to place except it be that body in which it lives, and to which it gives life. Whence, if any member of the body perishes, it becomes dead and immovable. Therefore, devils cannot move a body from place to place except it be a body to which they give life. It has been shown, however, and is acknowledged that devils do not bestow life on anybody. Therefore, they cannot move human semen locally, that is, from place to place, from body to body. 
Moreover, every action is performed by contact, and especially the act of generation, but it does not seem possible that there can be any contact between the demon and human bodies, since he has not actual point of contact with them. Therefore, he cannot inject semen into a human body, and therefore, since this needs a certain bodily action, it would seem that the devil cannot accomplish it. Besides, devils have no power to move those bodies which in a natural order are more closely related to them. For example, the heavenly bodies. Therefore, they have no power to move those bodies which are more distant and distinct from them. The, ma this, the major is proved, since the power that moves and the p movement are one and the same thing, and according to Aristotle and his physics. It follows, therefore, that devils who move heavenly bodies must be in heaven, which is wholly untrue, both in our opinion and in the opinion of the Platonists. Moreover, St. Augustine on the Trinity 3 says that devils do indeed collect human semen, by means of which they are able to produce bodily effects. But this cannot be done without some local movement, Therefore, demons can transfer semen which they have collected and inject it into the bodies of others. But, as Walfrid Strabo says in his commentary upon Exodus 7, 2, And Pharaoh called the wise men and the magicians, devils go about the earth, collecting every sort of seed, and can be working upon them broadcast, broadcast various species. See also the gloss on those words, Pharaoh called. And again in Genesis 6, the gloss makes two comments on the words, And the sons of God, so the daughters of men, first that by the sons of God are meant the sons of Seth, and by the daughters of men the daughters of Cain. Second, that giants were created not by some incredible, incredibly act of men, but by certain devils which, which are shameless towards women. For the Bible says, giants were upon the earth. Moreover, even after the flood, the bodies, not only of men, but also of women, were preeminently and incredibly beautiful. Answer. For the sake of brevity, much concerning the power of the devil and his works, and the matter of the effects of witchcraft is left out, for the pious reader either accepts it as proved, or he may, if he wish to inquire, find every point clear clearly elucidated in the second book of sen sentences 5. For he will see that the devils perform all their works consciously and voluntarily. For the nature that was given them has not been changed. See Dionysius in his fourth chapter on the subject. Their nature remained intact and very splendid, although they cannot use it for any good purpose. And as to their intelligence, he will find that they excel in three points of understanding, in their age-long experience and in the revelation of the higher spirits. He will find also how, through the influence of the stars, they learn the dominating characteristics of men, and so discover that some are more disposed to work witchcraft than others, and th that they molest these chiefly for the purpose of such works. And as to their will, the reader will find that it cleaves unchangeably to evil, and that they continuously sin in pride, envy, and gross covetousness, and that God, for his own glory, permits them to work against his will. He will also understand how with these two qualities of intellect and will, devils do marvels, so that there is no power in earth which can be compared to them. There is no power on earth which can be compared with him who was created that he should fear no one. But here the gloss says, although he fears no one, he is yet subject to the merits of the saints. He will find also how the devil knows the thoughts of our hearts, how he can substantially and disastrously metamorphose bodies with the help of an agent, how he can move bodies locally and alter the outward and inner feelings to every conceivable extent, and how he can change the intellect and will of a man, however indirectly. For although this is pertinent to our present inquiry, we wish only to draw some conclusion therefrom as to the nature of devils, and so proceed to the discussion of our question. 
Now the theologians have ascribed to them certain qualities, as that they are unclean spirits, yet not very un nature unclean. For according to Dionysius, there is in them a natural madness, a rabid concupiscence, a wanton fancy, as is seen from their spiritual sins of pride, envy, and wrath. For this reason they are the enemies of the human race, rational in mind, but reasoning without words, subtle in wickedness, eager to hurt, ever fertile in fresh deceptions. They change the perceptions and befoul the emotions of men. They confound the watchful and in dreams disturb the sleeping. They bring diseases, stir up tempests, disguise themselves as angels of light, bear hell always about them, from witches they usurp to themselves the worship of God. And by this means magic spells are made. They seek to get a mastery over the good and molest them to the most of their power. To elect, to the elect they are given as a temptation, and always they lie and wait for the destruction of men. And although they have a thousand ways of doing harm, and have tried ever since their downfall to bring about schisms in the church, to disable charity, to infect with the gall of envy the sweetness of the acts of the saints, in every way to subvert and perturb the human race, yet their power remains confined to the privy parts uh, and the navel. For through the wantonness of the flesh they have much power over men, and in men the source of wantonness lies in the privy parts, since it is from them that the semen falls, just as in women it falls from the navel. These things, then, being granted for a proper understanding of the question of incubi and succubi, it must be said that it is just as Catholic a view to hold that men may at times be begotten by means of incubi and succubi, as it is contrary to the words of the saints and even to the tradition of, the, of Holy Scripture to maintain the opposite opinion. And this is proved as follows. St. Augustine in one place raises this question, not indeed as regards witches, but with reference to the very works of devils and to the fables of the poets, and leave the matter in some doubt. Though later on, his, on he is definite in the matter of Holy Scripture, for in his Decutia Di, Book 3, Chapter 2, he says, We leave open the question whether it was possible for Venus to give birth to Aeneas through coition with Anchises. For a similar question arises in the scriptures, where it is asked whether evil angels lay with the daughters of men, and thereby the earth was then filled with giants. There is to say, pre preternaturally, big and strong men. But he settles the question in Book 5, Chapter 23, in these words. It is a general, very general belief, the truth of which is vouched for by many from their own experience, or at least from hearsay, as having been experienced by men of undoubted trustworthiness, that satyrs and fawns, which are commonly called incubi, have appeared to wanton women, and have sought and obtained coalition with them, and that certain devils, which the Gauls called Ducey, assiduously attempt and achieve this filthiness, is vouched for by so many credible witnesses that it would seem impudent to deny it. Later in the same book, he settles the second contention, namely that the passages in Genesis about the sons of God, that is Seth, and the daughters of men, that is Cain, does not speak only of incubi, since the existence of such is not credible. In this connection, there is the gloss which we have touched upon before. He says that it is not outside belief that the giants of whom Scripture speaks were begotten not by men, but by angels or certain devils who lust after women. To the same effect is the gloss in Esseus, where the prophet foretells the desolation of Babylon and the monsters that should inhabit it. He says, Owls shall dwell there, and satyrs shall dance there. By satyrs, here devils are meant. As the gloss says, satyrs are wild, shaggy creatures of the woods, which are a certain kind of devils called incubi. And again in Esseus, where he prophesies the desolation of the land, of the Edomians, because they persecuted the Jews, he says, and it shall be an habitation of dragons and a court for owls. The wild beasts also of the desert shall meet. 
The interlinear gloss interprets this as monsters and devils, and in the same place, Blessed Gregory explains these to be woodland gods under another name, not those which the Greeks call pans, and the Latins incubi. Similarly, Blessed Isidore, in the last chapter of his eighth book, says satyrs are they who, who, who are called pans in the Greek and incubi in Latin, and they are called incubi from their practice of overlaying, that is, debauching. For they are often lust lecherously after women and copulate with them, and the Gauls name them Ducey, because they are diligent in this beastliness. But the devils, which the common people call an incubus, the Romans call a fig fawn, to which Horace said, O Faunus, love of fleeing nymphs, so gently over my lands and smiling fields. Hey, Swell. All right. Yeah, let's continue. Hope you're all enjoying this as much as I am. Question four. By which devils are the operations operations of incubus and succubus practice? Is it Catholic to affirm that the functions of incubi and succubi belong indifferently and equally to all unclean spirits? And it seems that it is so. For to affirm the opposite would be to maintain that ir there is some good order among them. It is argued that just as in the computation of the good there are degrees and orders, see St. Augustine in his book on the nature of the good, so also the computation of the evil is based upon confusion. But as among the good, angels, nothing can be without order. So among the bad, all is disorder, and therefore they all indifferently follow these practices. See Job 10. A land of darkness, as darkness itself, and of the shadow of death, without any order, and where the light is as darkness. Again, if they do not all indifferently follow these practices, this quality in them comes either from their nature, or from sin, or from punishment. But it does not come from their nature, since they are all without distinction given to sin, as was set out in the preceding question, for they are by nature impure spirits, yet not so unclean as to pejorate their good parts, subtle in wickedness, eager to do harm, swollen with pride, etc. Therefore, these practices in them are their good parts, subtle. No. No. Therefore, these practices in them are due either to sin or to punishment. Then again, where the sin is greater, there is the punishment greater. And the higher angels sin more greatly, therefore their punishment they have the more to follow these filthy practices. If this is not so, another reason will be given why they do not indifferently practice these things. And again, it is argued that where there is no discipline or obedience, they all work without distinction. And it is submitted that there is no discipline or obedience among devils, and no agreement. Proverbs 13, among the proud there is always contention. Again, just as because of sin they will all equally be case, cast into hell after the day of judgment, so before that time they are detained in the lower mists on account of the duties assigned to them. We do not read that there is equality on account of emancipation, therefore neither is there equality in the matter of duty and temptation. But against this there is the first gloss on I Corinthians 15. As long as the world endures, angels are set over angels, men over men, and devils over devils. Also in Job, it speaks of the scales of Leviathan, which signify the members of the devil, how one cleaves to another. Therefore, there is among them diversity both of order and of action. 
Another question arises, whether or not the devils can be restrained by the good angels from pursuing these foul practices. It must be said that the angels to whose command the adverse influences are subject are called powers, as St. Gregory says in St. Augustine, a rebellious and sinful spirit of life is subject to an obedient, pious, and just spirit of life. And those creatures which are more perfect and nearer to God have authority over the others, for the whole order of preference is originally and in the first place in God, and is shared by his creatures according as they approach more nearly to him. Therefore the good angels, who are nearest to God on account of their fruition in him, which the devils lack, have preference over the devils and rule over them. And when it is urged that devils work much harm without any medium, or that they are not hindered because they are not subject to good angels who might prevent them, or that if they are sub so subject, then the evil that is done by the subject is due to negligence on the part of the master, and there seems to be some negligence among the good angels. The answer is that the angels are ministers of, of the divine wisdom. It follows then that, as the divine wisdom permits, certain evil to be done by bad angels or men for the sake of the good that he draws therefrom, so also the good angels do not altogether prevent wicked men or devils from doing evil. Answer. It is Catholic to maintain that there is a certain order of interior and exterior actions and a degree of preference among devils. Whence it follows that certain abominations are committed by the lowest orders, from which the higher orders are precluded on account of the nobility of their natures. And this is generally said to arise from a threefold congruity, in that such things harmonize with their nature, with the divine wisdom, and with their own wickedness. But more particularly, as touching their nature, it is agreed that from the beginning of creation some were always by nature superior, since they differ among themselves as to form, and no two angels are alike in form. This follows the more general opinion, which also agrees with the words of the philosophers, Dionysus, Dionysus also lays it down in his tenth chapter on the celestial hierarchy, that in the same order there are three separate degrees, and we must agree with this, since they are both immaterial and incorporeal. See also St. Thomas. For sin does not take away their nature, and the devil after the fall did not lose their natural gifts, as has been said before, and the operations of things follows their natural conditions. Therefore, both in nature and in operation, they are various and multiple. This harmonizes also with the divine wisdom, for that which is ordained is ordained by God. And since devils are deputed by God for the temptation of men and the punishment of the damned, therefore they work upon men from without by many and various means. It harmonizes also with their own wickedness, for since they are at war with the human race, they fight in an orderly manner, for so they think to do greater harm to men, and so they do. Whence it follows that they do not share in an equal manner in their most unspeakable abominations. And this is more specifically proved as follows, for since, as he has been said, the operation follows the nature of the thing, it follows also that those who, whose natures are subordinate must in turn be subordinate to themselves in operation, just as in the case of incorporeal matters. For since the lower bodies are by natural ordination below the celestial bodies, and their actions and motions are subject to the actions and motions of the celestial bodies, and since the devils, as has, as has been s said, differ among themselves in natural order, therefore they also differ among themselves in their natural actions, both extrinsic and intrinsic, and especially in the performance of the abominations in question. From which it is concluded that since the practice of these abominations is for the most part foreign in the to the nobility of the angelic nature, so also in human actions the foulest and beastliest acts are to be considered by themselves and not in relation to the duty of human nature in procreation. 
Finally, since some are believed to have fallen from every order, it is not unsuitable to maintain that those devils who fell from the lowest choir and evil in, in that held the lowest rank are deputed to, to and perform these and other abominations. Also, it must be carefully noted that, though the scripture speaks of incubi and succubi, lusting after women, yet nowhere do we read that incubi and succubi fell into vices against nature. We do not speak only of sodomy, but of any other sin whereby the act is wrongfully performed outside the rightful channel. And the very great enormity of such as sin in this way is shown by the fact that all devils equally of whatsoever ever order abominate and think shame to commit such actions. And it seems that the gloss on Ezekiel's 19 means this, where it says, I will give thee into the hands of the dwellers in Palestine, that is, devils, who shall blush at your inequities, meaning vices against nature. And the student will see what should be authoritatively understood concerning devils, for no sin has God so often punished by the shameful death of multitudes. Indeed, many say, and it is truly believed, that no one can unimperiled persevere in the practice of such vices beyond the period of the mortal life of Christ, which lasted for thirty-three years, unless he should be saved by some special grace of the Redeemer. And this is proved by the fact that there have often been ensnared by this vice octogenarians and centenarians, who had up to that time ruled their lives according to the discipline of Christ, and having forsaken him, they have found the very greatest difficulty in obtaining deliverance and in abandoning themselves to such vices. Moreover, the names of the devils indicate that order there is among, this, among them, and what office is assigned to each. For though one and the same name, that of devil, is generally used in Scripture because of their various qualities, yet the Scriptures teach that one is set over these filthy actions, just as certain others, other vices are subject to another. For it is the practice of Scripture and of speech to name every unclean spirit diabolus, from dia, that is two, and bolus, that is morsel. For he kills two, th two things, the body and the soul, and this is in accordance with etymology, although in Greek diabolus means shut in prison, which also is apt, since he is not permitted to do as much harm as he wishes. Or diabolus may mean downflowing, since he flowed down, that is, fell down, both specifically and locally. He is also named demon, that is, cunning over blood, since he thirsts for and procures sin with a threefold knowledge, being powerful in the subtlety of his nature, in his age-long experience, and in the revelation of the good spirits, he, he is called also Belial, which means without yoke or master, for he can fight against him to whom he should be subject. He is called also Be Beelzebub, which means Lord of Flies, that is, of the souls of sinners who have left the true faith of Christ. Also, Satan, that is, the adversary. For your adversary the devil goeth about, etc. Also behemoth that is beast, because he makes men bestial. But the very devil of fornication, and the chief of that abomination, is called Esmodius, which means the creature of judgment. For because of this kind of sin is a terrible judgment was executed upon Saddam and the four other cities, Similarly, the devil of pride is called Leviathan, which means their addition. Because when Lucifer tempted our first parents, he promised them, out of his pride, the addition of divinity. Concerning him the Lord said through Isaias, I shall visit it upon Leviathan, that old and torturous serpent. And the devil of avarice and riches is called Mammon. Mammon whom also Christ mentions in the Gospels. St. Matthew 6, Ye cannot serve God, etc. To the arguments, first, that good can be found without evil, but evil cannot be found without good. 
For it is poured upon a creature that is good in itself, and therefore the devils, in so far as they have a good nature, were ordained in the course of nature and for their actions. See Job 10. Secondly, it cannot be said that the devils deputed to work are not in hell, but in the lower myths, and they have here an order among themselves, which they will not have in hell, from which it may be said that all order ceased among them, as touching the attainment of blessedness at that time when they felt irrevo uh, irrevocably from such rank. And it may be said that even in hell there will be among them a graduate gradation of power and of the affliction of punishments inasmuch as some and not others will be deputed to torment the souls. But this gradation will come rather from God than from themselves, as will also their torments. Thirdly, when it is said that the higher devils, because they sin the more, are the more punished, and must therefore be the more bound to the commission of these filthy acts, it is answered that sin bears relation to punishment, and not to act to the act or operation of nature. And therefore it is by reason of their nobility of nature that these are not given to such filthiness, and it has nothing to do with their sin or punishment. And though they are all impure spirits and eager to do harm, yet one is more so than another, in proportion as their natures are the further thrust into darkness. Fourthly, it is said that there is agreement among devils, but of wickedness rather than friendship, in that they hate mankind and strive their utmost against justice. For such agreement is found among the wicked, that they band themselves together and depute those whose talents seem so seem suitable to the pursuit of particular in iniquities. Fifthly, although imprisonment is an equally decreed for all, now in the lower atmosphere and afterwards in hell, yet not therefore are equal penalties and duties equally ordained for them. For the nobler they are in the nature and the more potent in office, the heavier is the torment to which they are subjected. See Wisdom 6. The powerful shall powerfully suffer torments. All right. Question 5. What is the source of the increase of works of witchcraft? Whence comes it that the practice of witchcraft hath so notably increased? Is it any way a Catholic opinion to hold that the origin and growth of witchcraft proceed from the influence of the celestial bodies or from the abundant wickedness of men and not from the abominations of incubi and succubi? And it seems that it springs from man's own wickedness. For St. Augustine says that the cause of a man's depravity lies in his own will, whether he sins at his own or at another's suggestion. But a witch is depraved through sin. Therefore the cause of it is not the devil, but human will. In the same place he speaks of free will, that everyone is the cause of his own wickedness. And he reasons thus, that the sin of man proceeds from free will, but the devil cannot destroy free will, for this would militate against liberty. Therefore the devil cannot be the cause of that or any other sin. Again, in the book of Ecclesiastic Dogma it is said, Not all our evil thoughts are stirred up by the devil, but sometimes they arise from the operation of our own judgment. Again, if the stars were not the cause of human actions, both good and bad, astrologers would not so frequently foretell the truth about the result of wars and other human acts. Therefore, they are in some way a cause. Again, the stars influence the devils themselves in the causing of certain spells, and therefore they can all the more influence man. Three proofs are adduced for this assumption. For certain men, who are called lunatics, are molested by devils, more at one time than at another, and the devils would not so behave, but would rather molest them at all times, unless they themselves were deeply affected by certain phases of the moon. It is proved again from the fact the necromancers observe certain constellations for the invoking of devils, which they would not do unless they knew that the devils were subject to the stars. And this is also adduced as a proof 
that according to St. Augustine, de Cucia de 10, the devils employ certain lower bodies, such as herbs, stones, animals, and certain sounds and voices and figures. But since the heavenly bodies are more are of more potency than the lower bodies, therefore the stars are a far, far greater influence than these things. And witches are the more in subjection, in that their deeds proceed from the influence of those bodies, and not from the help of evil spirits. And the argument is supported from I Kings 16, where Saul was vexed by a devil, but was calmed when David struck his heart before him, and the evil departed. But against this, it is impossible to produce an effect without its cause, and the deeds of witches are such that they cannot be done without the help of devils, as is shown by the description of witches in St. Is Isidore, Ethics 8. Witches are so called from the enormity of their magic spells, for they disturb the elements and confound the minds of men, and without any venomous draught, but merely by virtue of incantations, destroy souls, etc. But this sort of effects cannot be caused by the influence of the stars through the agency of man. Besides, Aristotle says in his eth Ethics that it is difficult to know what is the beginning of the operation of thought and shows that it must be something extrinsic, for everything that begins from a beginning has some cause. Now a man begins to do that which he wills, and he begins to will because of some pre-suggestion. And if this is some precedent suggestion, it must either proceed from the infinite, or there is some extrinsic beginning which first brings a suggestion to a man. Unless indeed it be argued that this is a matter of chance, from which it would follow that all human actions are fortuitous, which is absurd. Therefore, the beginning of good in the good is said to be God, who is not the cause of sin. But for the wicked, when a man begins to be influenced towards and wills to commit sin, there must also be some extrinsic cause of this. And this can be no other than the devil, especially in the case of witches, as is shown above. For the stars cannot influence such acts, therefore the truth is plain. Moreover, that which has power over the motive has also power over the result, which is caused by the motive. Now the motive of the will is something perceived through the sense or the intellect, both of which are subject to the power of the devil. For St. Augustine says in Book 83, This evil, which is of the devil, creeps in all the sensual approaches. He places himself in figures. He adapts himself to colors. He attaches himself to sounds. He lurks in angry and wrongful conversation. He abides in smells. He impregnates with flavors and fills with certain exhalations all the channels of the understanding. Therefore, it is seen that it is the devil's power to influence the will, which is directly the cause of sin. Besides, everything which has a choice of two ways needs some determining factor before it proceeds to the action. And the free will of man has the choice between good and ill. Therefore, when he embarks upon sin, it needs that he is determined by something towards ill. And this seems chiefly needs some determining devil, factor before it proceeds the to the action. And will, the free will of will man has the choice evil. between good Therefore, and ill. That Therefore, the when he embarks the upon the sin, cause of evil it needs man, that he especially is determined by something towards ill. Substantiated and this thus, seems chiefly just to be done by the devil, cleaves especially good, in the actions so of bad witches, angel to who will, who is formerly to man up into evil. goodness. Therefore, Therefore it seems him that the evil will of the devil is, it, is the cause of evil it will in man, Dionysius, especially in witches. The and the argument may be substantiated thus, that, the has that just as a good angel cleaves to good, so does a bad angel to evil. But Answer. the former leads a man Such into goodness, that therefore the latter leads him into in the evil. Of the For it is said, stand convicted of three errors. In the first place, it is not possible that it originated from astromancers and casters of horoscopes and fortune tellers. For if it is asked whether the vice of witchcraft in men is caused by the influence of the stars, then in consideration of the variety of men's characters, and for the upholding of the true faith, a distinction must be maintained. Namely, that there are two ways in which it can be understood that men's characters can be caused by the stars. 
either completely and of necessity, or by disposition and contingency. And as for the first, it is not only false, but so heretical and contrarily, contrary to the Christian religion that the true faith cannot be maintained in such an error. For this reason, he who argues that everything of necessity proceeds from the stars takes away all merit and, in consequence, all blame. Also he takes away grace and therefore glory, for uprightness of character suffers prejudice by this error. Since the blame of the sinner redounds upon the stars, license to sin without culpability is conceded, and man is committed to the worship and adoration of the stars. How are you again? Uh, is Liz hearing double? I don't know why it's doing double. Well, I'll listen to it later and see if I can figure it out. And I gotta remember where I was. All right, keep me updated, Reproof. Thank you. Besides, everything which has a choice of two ways okay. Besides, everything which has a choice of two ways needs some determining factor before it proceeds to the action. And the free will of man has the choice between good and ill. Therefore, when he embarks upon sin, it needs that he is determined by something towards ill. And this seems chiefly to be done by the devil, especially in the actions of witches, whose will is made up for evil. Therefore it seems that the evil will of the devil is the cause of evil will in man, especially in witches. And the argument may be substantiated thus, that just as a good angel cleaves to... Okay, we did that already. Ah, okay. Sorry about that. But as for the contention that men's characters are conditionally varied by the disposition of the stars, it is so far true that it is not contrary to, the, to reason or faith. For it is obvious that the disposition, disposition of a body variously causes many variations in the humors and character of the soul. For generally, the soul imitates the complexions of the body as it, as it said in the six principles. Wherefore, the choleric are wrathful, the sanguine are kindly, the melancholy are envious, and the phlegmatic are slothful. But this is not absolute, for the soul is master of its body, especially when it, ha it is helped by grace. And we see many choleric who are gently and me melancholy who are kindly. Therefore, when the virtue of the stars influences the formation and quality of man a man's humors, it is agreed that they are has some influence over the character, but very dis distantly. For the virtue of the lower nature has more effect on the quality of the humors than has the virtue of the stars. Wherefore, St. Augustine de Couche de Fa, where he resolves a certain question of two brothers who fell ill and were cured simultaneously, approves the reason reasoning of Hippocrates rather than that of an astronomer. For Hippocrates answered that it is owing to the similarity of their humors, and the astronomer answered that it was owing to the identity of their horoscopes. For the physician's answer was better, since he adduced the more powerful and immediate cause. Thus, therefore, it must be said that the influence of the stars is to some degree conducive to the wickedness of witches, if it be granted that there is any such influence of the bodies that predisposes them to this manner of abomination rather than to any other sort of works, either vicious or virtuous, but the disposition must not be said to be necessary, immediate and sufficient, but remote and contingent. 
Neither is that objection valid which is based on the book of the philosophers, on the properties of the elements, where it says that kingdoms are emptied and lands depopulated at the conjunction of Jupiter and Saturn, and it is argued from this that such things are to be understood as being outside the free will of men, and that therefore the influence of the stars has power over free will. For it is answered that in this saying the philosopher does not mean to imply that men cannot resist the influence of that constellation toward dissensions, but that they will not. For Ptolemy in Almagest says, A wise man will be the master of the stars. For although, since Saturn has a melancholy and bad influence, and Jupiter, Jupiter a very good influence, the conjunction of Jupiter and Saturn can dispose man, men to quarrels and discords. Yet through free will, men can resist that inclination very easily with, with the help of God's grace. And again, it is no valid objection to quote St. John D Damascene, where he says, Book 2, Chapter 6, that comets are often the sign of the death of kings. For it will be answered that even if we follow the opinion of St. John Damascene, which was as is evident in the book referred to, contrary to the opinion of the philosophic way, yet this, this is no proof of the inevitability of human actions. For St. John considers that a comet is not a natural creation, nor is it one of the stars set in the firmament. Wherefore, neither its significance nor influence is natural. For he says that comets are not of the stars which were created in the beginning, but that they are made for a particular occasion, and then dissolved by divine command. This then is the opinion of St. John da Damascene. But God by such a sign foretells the death of kings rather than of m other men, both because from this may arise the confusion of a kingdom. And the angels are more careful to watch over kings for the general good, and kings are born and die under the ministry of angels. And there is no difficulty in the opinion of, of the philosophers who say that a comet is a hot and dry conglomeration generated in the higher part of space near the fire, and that its conjoined globe with the hot and dry vapor assumes the likeness of a star. But unincorporated parts of the, that vapor stretch in long extremities joined to that globe and are a sort of ad adjunct to it. And according to this view, not of itself, but by accident, it predicts death, which proceeds from hot and dry infirmities. And since, for the most part, the rich are fed on things of a hot and dry nature, therefore at such times many of the rich die, among which the death of kings and princes is the most notable. And this view is not far from the view of St. John Damascene, there, when carefully considered, except as regards the operation and cooperation of the angels, which not even the philosophers can ignore. For indeed, when the vapors and their dryness and heat have nothing to do with the generation of a comet, even then, for reasons already set out, the comet may be formed by the operation of an angel. In this way, the star which pretended the death of the learned St. Thomas was not one of the stars set in the firmament, but was formed by an angel from some convenient material, and having performed its office, was again dissolved. From this we see that, whichever of these opinions we follow, the stars have no inherent influence over the free will, or, consequently, over the malice and character of men. It is to be noted also that astronomers often foretell the truth and that their judgments are for the most part effective on one province or one nation. And the reason is that they take their judgments from the stars, which, according to the more probable view, have a greater, though not an inevitable, influence over the actions of mankind in general, that is, over one nation or province than over one individual person. And this because the greater part of the one nation more closely obeys the natural disposition of the body than does one single man. But this is mentioned incidentally. And the second of the three ways by which we vindicate the Catholic standpoint is by refuting the errors of those who cast horoscopes and mathematicians who worship the goddess of fortune. Of these, St. Isidore, Ethics 8, volume 9, says that those who cast horoscopes 
are so called from their examination of the stars at nativity and are commonly called mathematicians. In the same book, chapter 2, he says that fortune has her name from the fortuitousness and is a sort of goddess who mocks human affairs in a haphazard and fortuitous manner. Wherefore, wherefore she is called blind, since she runs here and there with no consideration for desert, and comes indifferently to good and bad, so much for Isidore. But to believe that there is such a goddess, or that the harm done to bodies and creatures which is ascribed to witchcraft does not actually proceed from witchcraft, but from the same goddess of fortune is sheer idolatry. And also to assert that witches themselves were born for that very purpose, that they might perform such deeds in the world is similarly alien to the faith and indeed to the general teaching of the philosophers. Anyone who pleases may refer to St. Thomas in the third book of his Summa of the Faith against the Gentiles, question 87, etc., and he will find much to this effect. Nevertheless, one point must be omitted for the sake of those who perhaps have not great quantity of books. It is no, there noted that three things are to be considered in man, which are directed by three celestial causes, namely the act of the will, the act of the intellect, and the act of the body. The first of these is governed directly and solely by God, the second by an angel, and the third by a celestial body. For choice and will are directly governed by God for good works. As the scripture says in Proverbs 21, The heart of the king is in the hand of the Lord. He turneth it with whithersoever he will. And it says the heart of the king to signify that as the great cannot oppose his will, so are others even less able to do so. Also, St. Paul says, God who causeth us to wish and to perform that which is good. Ugh, it's getting raspy. Question 6. Concerning witches who copulate with devils, why is it that women are chiefly addicted to evil superstitions? There is also concerning witches who copulate with devils much difficulty in considering the methods by which such abominations are consummated. On the part of the devil, first of what element the body is made that he assumes. Secondly, whether the act is always accompanied by the injection of semen received from another. Thirdly, as to time and place, whether he commits this act more frequently at one time than at another. Fourthly, whether the act is invisible to any who may be standing by. And on the part of the women, it has to be inquired whether only they who were themselves conceived in this filthy manner are often visited by devils, or secondly, whether it is those who were offered to the devils by midwives at the time of their birth, and thirdly, whether the actual venereal delectation of such is of a weaker sort. But we cannot here re reply to all these questions, both because we are only engaged in a general study, and because in the second part of this work they are all singly explained by their operations as will appear in the fourth chapter, where mention is made of each separate method. Therefore, let us now chiefly consider women, and first, why this kind of perfidy is found more in so fragile a sex than in men, and our inquiry will first be general as to the general conditions of women, secondly, particular as to which sort of women are found to be given to superstition and witchcraft, and thirdly, specifically with regard to midwives who surpass all others in wickedness. Why superstition is chiefly, f chiefly found in women. As for the first question, why a greater number of witches is found in the fragile feminine sex than among men? It is indeed a fact that it were idle to contradict since it is accredited by actual experience apart from the verbal testimony of credible witnesses, and without in any way detracting from a sex in which God has always taken gr great glory that his might should be spread abroad, let us say that various men have assigned various reasons for this fact, which nevertheless agree in principle. Wherefore it is good for the abomination of women, 
admonition of women to speak of this matter, and it has often been approved by experience that they are eager to hear of it, so long as it is set forth with discretion. For some learned men propound this reason, that there are three things in nature, the tongue, an ecclesiastic, and a woman, which know no moderation in goodness or vice, and when they exceed the bounds of their condition, they reach the greatest heights and the lowest depths of goodness and vice. When they are governed by a good spirit, they are most excellent in virtue, but when they are governed by an evil spirit, they indulge the worst possible vices. This is clear in the case of the tongue, since by its ministry most of the kingdoms have been brought into the faith of Christ. And the Holy Ghost appeared over the apostles of Christ in tongues of fire. Other learned preachers also have had, as it were, tongues of dogs, licking wounds, and sores of the dying Lazarus. As it is said, with the tongues of dogs ye save your souls from the enemy. For this reason, St. Dominic, the leader and father of the order of preachers, is represented in the figure of a barking dog with a in a figure of a barking dog with a lighted torch in his mouth, that even to this day he may be, by his barking keep off the heretic wolves from the flock of Christ's sheep. It also it is also a matter of common experience that the tongue of one prudent man can subdue the wrangling of a multitude. Where Wherefore, not unjustly, Solomon sings much in their praise, in Proverbs 10. In the lips of him that hath understanding, wisdom is found. And again, the tongue of the just is as choice silver. The heart of the wicked is little worth. And again, the lips of the righteous feed many, but fools die for want of wisdom. For this cause, he adds in chapter 16, The preparations of the heart belong to man, but the answer of the tongue is from the Lord. But concerning an evil tongue, you will find in Ecclesiasticus, a backbiting tongue hath disquieted many, and driven them from nation to nation. Strong cities hath it, hath it pulled down, and overthrown the houses of great men. And by a backbiting tongue it means a third party, who rashly or spitefully interferes between two contending parties. Secondly, concerning e Ecclesiastics, that is to say, clerics and religious of other, either sex, St. John Chrysodom speaks on the text. He cast out that out them that bought and sold from the temple. From the priesthood arises everything good and everything evil. St. Jerome is, in his epistle to Nepotian says, Avoid as you would the plague of trading priest, who has risen from poverty to riches, from a low to a high estate. And blessed Bernard, in his 23rd homily on the Psalms, says of clerics, If one should arise as an open heretic, let him be cast out and put to silence. If he is a violent enemy, let all good men flee from him. But how are we to know which ones to cast out or to flee from? For they are confusedly friendly and hostile, peaceable and quarrelsome, neighborly and utterly selfish. And in another place, our bishops are become spearmen, and our pastors shears, and by bishops shears meant those proud abbots who impose he heavy labors on their inferiors, which they would not themselves touch with their little fingers. And St. Gregory says concerning pastors, no one does more harm in the church than he who, having the name or order of sanctity, lives in sin, for no one dares to accuse him of sin. And therefore the sin is widely spread, since the sinner is honored for the sanct sanctity of his order. Blessed Augustine also speaks of the monks to Vincent, the Don Donatist. I freely confess to, you, to your chastity before the Lord our God, which is the witness of my soul. From the time I began to serve God, what great difficulty I have experienced in the fact that that it is impossible to find either worse or better men than those who grace or disgrace the monasteries. Now the wickedness of women is spoken in Ecclesi Ecclesiastes 25. There is no head above the head of a serpent, and there is no wrath above the wrath of a woman. I had rather dwell with a lion and a dragon than to keep house with a wicked woman. 
And among much which in that place proceeds and follows about a wicked woman, he concludes, All wickedness is but little to the wickedness of a woman. Wherefore, St. John Chrysostom says on the text, It is not good to marry. St. Matthew 19. What else is woman but a foe to friendship, an unescapable punishment, a necessary evil, a natural temptation, a desirable calamity, a domestic danger, a delectable de detriment, an evil of nature painted with fair colors? Therefore, if it be a sin to divorce her when she ought to be kept, it is indeed a necessary torture. For either we commit adultery by divorcing her, or we must endure daily strife. Cicero, in his second book of the Rhetoric, says, The many lusts of men lead them into one sin, but the lust of women leads them into all sins. For the root of all women's vices is avarice. And Seneca says in his tragedies, a woman either loves or hates, there is no third grade, and the tears of woman are a deception, for they may spring from, the, from true grief, or they may be a snare. When a woman thinks alone, she thinks evil. But for good women, there is so much praise, that we read that they have brought beatitude to men, and have saved nations, lands, and cities, as is clear in the case of Judith, Deborah, and Esther. See also I Corinthians 7. If a woman hath a husband that believeth not, let her not leave him, for the unbelieving husband is sanctified by the believing wife. In Ecclesiasticus 26, Blessed is the man who has a virtuous wife, for the number of his days shall be doubled. And, the th and throughout the chapter, much high praise is spoken of the excellence of good women as also is the last chapter of Proverbs concerning a virtuous woman. And all this is made clear also in the New Testament concerning women and virgins and other holy women who have by faith led nations and kingdoms away from the worship of idols concern, to the Christian religion. Women and virgins, Anyone who and looks at other Vincent holy women who have by faith led Uvay, nations Uvay, and Uvay, kingdoms away from the worship of idols find marvelous the Christian religion of the conversion Anyone of who Hungary looks at Vincent by the most Christian Galia and the Franks by Clotilda will the wife find of marvelous Clovis. things Wherefore, in of many the conversion of Hungary by the most that we Christian read against Galia, women. The word and the Franks woman by Clotilda is used to mean the, the wife of Clovis. Flesh. As Wherefore, said, in many I have found recuperations more that we read against death, women, and good word woman, subject woman is used lust. to mean the lust of the flesh. As it is said, other again, I have found a woman other reasons, more bitter than why death, there are more and good women subject to carnal lust. And the first is that they other are more again have propounded and other reasons the chief aim of the why there are more superstitious faith, women found than he men. Rather attacks and them. the first is the that they are more credulous. And since the chief aim of the devil he is to that corrupt is quick faith, to believe, therefore is he rather it shall be them. diminished. See, the second reason is that women 19. are naturally more impressionable, and more he ready to receive quick to the believe is light-minded and spirit. shall be diminished. And that when the second are, reason is that women are naturally more well, they are very good, but when more ready to receive the influence of a disembodied spirit. The third and that when they are that they, they have use this quality, well, they are, are able they are very to good, conceal from but when they use it ill, those they are very which evil. By evil arts, they know. The third reason and is that they have weak, slippery they tongues, and easy and are unable to conceal from the fellow woman by witchcraft. Those things which by evil arts they know. Quoted above. And since I they are weak, well they find an easy and secret manner to keep vindicating themselves by witchcraft. All wickedness is Ecclesiasticus is quoted above. I'd rather dwell with a lion than a dragon to keep house with they wicked are woman. very impressionable. All wickedness, wickedness is but little to the wickedness of there women. There are also others, and to this bring may be added that other reasons, as they which are very impressionable, be very careful they how they make them. use. For it is true, there are also that others in the Old Testament who would bring the scriptures forward have yet much other reasons to say of which about creatures women. should be very this because of the first temptress Eve and her imitators. Yet afterward, in the New Testament, we find a change of name. As from Eva to Ava, as St. Jerome says, in the whole sin of Eve, taken away by the benediction of Mary, therefore preachers should always say as much praise of them as possible. But because in these times there's this perfidy is more often found in women than men, in men, as we learn by actual experience, if anyone is curious as to the reason, we may add to the 
to what has already been said, the following, that since they are feebler both in mind and body, it is not surprising that they should come more under the spell of witchcraft. For as regards intellect or the understanding of spiritual things, they seem to be of a different nature from men, a fact which is vouched for by the logic of the authorities, backed by various examples from the scriptures. Terence says women are intellectually like children, and Lactanius, no woman understood philosophy except Temesta, and Proverbs 11, as if it were describing a woman, says, As a jewel of, of gold in a swine's snout, so is a fair woman which is without dis discretion. But the natural reason is that she is more carnal than a man, as is clear from her many carnal abominations. And it should be noted that there was a defect in the formation of the first woman, since she was formed from a bent rib, that is, a rib of the breast which is bent, as it were, in a contrary direction to a man. And since through the defect she is an imperfect animal, she always deceives. For Cato says, when a woman weeps, she weaves snares. And again, when a woman weeps, she labors to deceive a man. And this is shown by Samson's wife, who coaxed him to tell her the riddle he had propounded to the Philistines, and told them the answer, and so deceived him. And it is clear in the case of the first woman, that she had little faith, for when the serpent asked why they did not eat of every tree in paradise, she answered, of every tree, etc., lest perchance we die. Thereby she showed that she doubted and had little in the word of God. And all this is indicated by the etymology of the word, for femina comes from fe and minus since she is ever weaker to hold and preserve the faith, and this is, as regards faith is of her very nature, although both by grace and nature faith never failed in the blessed virgin, even at the time of Christ's passion when it failed in all men. Therefore a wicked woman is by her nature quicker to waver in her faith, and consequently quicker to abjure the faith, which is the root of witchcraft. And as to her other mental quality, that is her natural will, when she hates someone more whom she formerly loved, then she sees with anger and impatience in her whole soul, just as the tides of the sea are always heaving and boiling. Many authorities allude to this cause. Ecclesiasticus 25. There is no wrath above the wrath of a woman. And Seneca, Tragedies 8. No might of the flames, the swollen winds, no deadly weapon is so much to be feared as the lust and hatred of a woman who has been divorced from the marriage bed. This is shown too in the women who falsely accused Joseph and caused him to be imprisoned because he would not consent to the crime of adultery with her. And truly, the most powerful cause which contributes to the increase of witches is the woeful rivalry between married folk and unmarried women and men. This is so even among holy women, so what must it be among the others? For you see in Genesis 21 how impatient and envious Sarah was of Hagar, Hagar when she conceived, how jealous Rachel was of Leah because she had no children, Genesis 30, and Hannah who was barren of the fruitful Penina, I Kings 1, and how Miriam, Numbers 12, murmured and spoke ill of Moses, and was therefore stricken with leprosy, and how Martha was jealous of Mary Magdalene, because she was busy, and Mary was sitting down. To this point in Ecclesiasticus 37, neither consult with a woman touching her of whom she is jealous, meaning that it is useless to consult with her, since there is always jealousy, that is, envy, in a wicked woman. And if women behave thus to each other, how much more will they do so to men? That's the end of that question. Uh, one more question. Question 7. Whether witches can sway the minds of men to love or hatred? It is asked whether devils, through the medium of witches, can change or incite the minds of men to inordinate love or hatred. And it is argued that, following the previous conclusions, they cannot do so. For there are three things in man, will, understanding, and body. The first is ruled by God, 
for the heart of the king is in the land of the Lord. The second is enlightened by an angel, and the body is governed by the motions of the stars. And as the devils cannot effect changes in the body, even less have they power to incite love or hatred in the soul. The consequence is clear, that they, though they have more power over things corporeal than over things spiritual, they cannot change even the body as has been often proved. For they cannot induce any substantial or accidental form, except is, as it were, their artificer. In this connection is quoted what has been said before, that whoever believes that any creature can be changed for the better or worse, or transformed into any other, another kind or likeness, except by the creator of all things, is worse than a pagan and a heretic. Besides, everything that acts with design knows its own effect. If, therefore, the devil could change the minds of men to hatred or love, he would also be able to see the inner thoughts of the heart. But this is contrary to what is said in the book of Ecclesiastic Dogma. The devil cannot see our inner thoughts, and again in the same place, not all our evil thoughts are from the devil, but sometimes they arise from our own choice. Besides, love and hatred are a matter of the will, which is rooted in the soul. Therefore, they cannot by any cunning be caused by the devil. The conclusion holds that he alone, as St. Augustine says, is able to enter into the soul who created it. Besides, it is not valid to argue that because he can influence the inner emotions, therefore he can govern the will, for the emotions are stronger than physical strength, and the devil can affect nothing in a physical way, such as the formation of flesh, flesh and blood. Therefore, he cannot affect nothing through the emotions. But against this, the devil is said to tempt men, not only visibly, but also invisibly. But this would not be true unless he were able to exert some influence over the inner mind. Besides, St. John De Damascene says, All evil and all filthiness is devised by the devil. And Dionysius de Divin, The multitude of devils is the cause of all evil, etc. Answer. First, one sort of cause is to be distinguished from another. Secondly, we shall show how the devil can affect the inner powers of the mind, that is, the emotions, and thirdly, we shall draw the fit con conclusion. And as to the first, it is to be considered that the cause of anything can be understood in two ways, either as direct or as indirect. For when something causes a disposition to, be, to some effect, it is said to be an occasional and indirect cause of that effect. In this way, it may be said that he who chops wood is the cause of the actual fire. And similarly, we may say that the devil is the cause of all our sins. So, for he incited the first man to sin, from whose sin it has been handed down to the whole human race to have an inclination towards sin. And in this way, are to be understood the words of St. John Damascene and Dionysius. But a direct cause is one that directly causes an effect, and in this sense the devil is not the cause of all sin. For all sins are not committed at the instigation of the devil, but some are of our own choosing. For Origen says, Even if the devil were not, men would still lust after food and venery and such things, and from these inordinate lusts much may result, unless such appetites be reasonably restrained. But to restrain such over ungoverned desire is the part of man's free will, over which even the devil has no power. And because this distinction is not sufficient to explain how the devil at times produces a frantic infatuation of love, it is further to be noted that though he cannot cause that inordinate love by directly compelling a man's will, yet he can do so by means of persuasion. And this again, in two ways, either visibly or invisibly. Visibly, when he appears to witches in the form of a man and speaks to them materially, persuading them to sin. So he tempted our first parents in paradise in the form of a serpent, and so he tempted Christ in the wilderness, appearing to him in visible form. But it is not to be thought that this is the only way he influences a man. For in that case, no sin would proceed from the devil's instruction, except such as were suggested by him, in visible form.
Therefore, it must be said that even invisibly he instigates man to sin, and he did he, and this he does in two ways, either by persuasion or by disposition. By persuasion he presents something to the understanding as to being a good thing, and this he can do in three ways, for he presents it either to the intellect or to the inner perceptions or to the outer. And as for the intellect, the human intellect can be helped by a good angel to understand a thing by means of enlightenment as Dionysius says, and to understand a thing according to Aristotle is to suffer something. Therefore the devil can impress some form upon the intellect by which the act of understanding is called forth. And it may be argued that the devil can do this by natural power, which is not, as has been shown, diminished. It is to be said, however, that he cannot do this by means of enlightenment, but persuasion. For the intellect of man is of the, that condition that the more it is enlightened, the more it knows the truth, and the more it can defend itself from deception. And because the devil intends his deception to be permanent, therefore no persuasion that he uses can be called enlightenment. Although it may be called revelation, in that when he invisibly uses persuasion by means of some impression, he plants something on the inner or outer sense. And by this, the reasoning intellect is persuaded to perform some action. But as to how he is enabled to create an impression on the inner sense, it is to be noted that the bodily nature is naturally born to be moved locally by the spiritual, which is clear from the case of our own bodies, which are moved by souls. And the same is the case with the stars, but it is not by nature adapted to be directly subject to influences, by which we mean outside influences, not those with, with which it is informed. Wherefore, the concurrence of some bodily agent is necessary, as proved in the seventh book of Metaphysics. Corporeal matter naturally obeys a good or bad angel, as to the locomotion. And it is due to this that devils can, through motion, collect semen and employ it for the production of wonderful results. This was how it happened that Pharaoh's magicians produced serpents and actual animals when corresponding active and passive agents were brought together. Therefore, there is nothing to prevent the devils from affecting anything that appertains to the local motion of corporeal matter, unless God prevent it. And now let us examine how the devil can, through local motion, excite the fancy and inner sensory perceptions of a man by apparitions and impulsive actions. It is, not, it is to be noted that Aristotle the Somna et Eugia, assigns the cause of apparitions and dreams through local motion to the fact that when an animal sleeps, the blood flows to the inmost seat of the senses, from which descend motions or impressions which remain from the past impressions preserved in the mind or inner perception, and these are fancy or imagination, which are the same thing according to St. Thomas, as will be shown. For fancy or imagination is as it were the treasury of ideas received through the senses, and through this it happens that devils stir up the inner perceptions, that is the power of conserving images, that they appear to be a new impression at the moment received from exterior things. It is true that all do not agree to this, but if anyone wishes to occupy himself with this question, he must consider the number and the office of the inner perceptions. According to Avicenna, in his book on the mind, there are five, namely, common sense, fancy, imagination, thought, and memory. But St. Thomas, in the first part of question 79, says that they are only four, since fancy and imagination are the same thing. For fear of pro prolixity, I admit much more that has a variously been said on this subject. Variously been said. Blech. Only this must be said, that fancy is the treasury of ideas, but memory appears to be something different. For fancy is the treasury or repository of ideas received through the senses, but memory is the treasury of instincts, which are not received through the senses. For when a man sees a wolf, he runs away, not because of its ugly color or appearance, which are ideas received through the outer senses and conserved in his fancy, but he runs away because the wolf is his natural enemy. And this he knows through some instinct or fear, which is apart from thought. 
which recognized the wolf as hostile, but a dog as friendly. But the repository of this, those instincts is memory, and the reception and retention are two different things in animal nature. For those who are of a human disposition receive readily, but retain badly, and the contrary is the case of those with a dry humor. To return to the question, the apparitions that come in dreams to sleepers proceed from the ideas retained in the repository of their mind through a natural local motion caused by the flow of blood to the first and inmost seat of their faculties of perception. And we must speak of an intrinsic local motion in the head and the cells of the brain. And this can also happen through a similar local motion created by devils. Also, such things happen not only to the sleeping, but even to those who are awake. For in these, also the devils can stir up and excite the inner perceptions and humors, so that ideas retained in the repositories of their minds are drawn out and made apparent to the faculties of fancy and imagination, so that such men imagine these things to be true, and this is called interior temptation. And it is no wonder that the devil can do this by his own natural power, since any man by himself, being awake and having the use of his reason, can voluntarily draw from his repositories the images he has retained in them, in such a way that he can summon to himself the image of whatsoever thing he pleases. And this being granted, it is easy to understand the matter of excessive infatuation in love. Now there are two ways in which devils can, as has been said, raise up this kind of image. Sometimes they work without enchaining the human reason, as has been said in the matter of temptation, the example of voluntary imagination. But sometimes the use of reason is entirely chained up, and this may be exemplified by certain naturally defective persons and by madmen and drunkards. Therefore, it is no wonder that devils can, with God's permission, chain up the reason, and such men are called delirious, because their senses have been snatched away by the devil. And this they do in two ways, either with or without the help of witches. For Aristotle, in the work we have quoted, says that anyone who lives in passion is moved by only a little thing, as a lover by the remotest likeness of his love, and similarly with one who feels hatred. Therefore, devils, who have learned from men's acts to which passions they are chiefly subject, incite them to this sort of inordinate love or hatred, impressing their purpose on men's imagination the more strongly and effectively, as they can do so the more easily, and this is the more easy for a lover to summon up the image of his love from his memory and retain it pleasurably in his thoughts. But they work by witchcraft when they do these things through and at the instance of witches, by reason of a pact entered into with them. But it is not possible to treat such matters in detail on account of great number of instances, both among the clergy and among the laity. For how many adulterers have put away the most beautiful wives to lust after the vilest of women? We know of an old woman who, according to the common account of the brothers in the mo that monastery even up to this day, in this manner not only bewitched three successive abbots, but even killed them, and in the same way drove the fourth out of his mind, for she herself publicly confessed it, and does not fear to say, I did so, and I do so, and they are not able to keep from loving me, because they have eaten so much of my dung, measuring off a certain length on her arm. I confess, moreover, that since we had no case to prosecute her or bring her to trial. She survives to this day. It will be remembered that it was said that the devil invisibly lures a man to sin not only because by means of persuasion, as has been said, but also by the means of disposition. Although this is not very pertinent, yet be it said that by similar admonition of the disposition and humors of men, he renders some more disposed to anger or con concupiscence or other passions. For it is manifest that a man who has a body so disposed is more prone to concupiscence and anger and such passions, and when they are aroused, he is more apt to surrender to them. But because it is difficult to quote precedence, therefore an easier method must be found of declaring them for the admonition of the people. 
And in the second part of this book, we treat the remedies by which men so bewitched can be set free. I guess, let me see here. Do one more. One more question. Question eight. Whether witches can habitate the powers of generation or obstruct the venereal act. Now the fact that adulterous drabs and whores are chiefly given to witchcraft is substantiated by the spells which are cast by witches upon the act of generation. And to make the truth more clear, we will consider the arguments, those who are in disagreement with us on this matter. And first, it is argued that such a bewitching is not possible, because if it were, it would apply equally to those who are married. And if this were conceded, then since matrimony is God's work and witchcraft is the devil's, the devil's work would be stronger than God's. But if it is allowed that it can be only affected, affect fornicators and the unmarried, this involves a return to the opinion that witchcraft does not really exist, but only in men's imagination. And this was refuted in the first question, or else some reason will be found why it should affect the unmarried and not the married. And the only possible reason is that matrimony is God's work. And since, according to the, the theologians, this re reason is not valid, there still remain the argument that it would make the devil's work stronger than God. And since it would be unseemly to make such an assertion, it is also unseemly to maintain that the venereal act can be obstructed by witchcraft. Again, the devil cannot obstruct the other natural actions, such as eating, walking, and standing, as is apparent from the fact that if he could, he could destroy the whole world. Besides, since the venereal act is common to all women, if it were obstructed, it would be so with reference to all women. But this is not so, and therefore the first argument is good, for the facts prove that it is not so. For when a man says that he has been bewitched, he is still quite capable as regards other women, though not with her, with whom he is unable to copulate. And the reason for this is that he does not wish to, and therefore cannot effect anything in that matter. <clears throat> On the contrary, and true side is the chapter in the Decadals, if by Sordilage, etc., as is also the opinion of all the theologians and canonists, where they treat of the obstruction to marriage caused by witchcraft. There is also another reason, that since the devil is more powerful than man, and a man can obstruct the generative powers by means of frigid herbs, or anything else that can be thought of, therefore much more can the devil do this, since he has greater knowledge and cunning. Answer. The truth is sufficiently evident from two matters, which have already been argued, although the method of obstruction has not been specifically declared. For it has been shown that witchcraft does not exist only in men's imaginations, and not in fact, but that truly and actually innumerable, innumerable bewitchments can happen, with the permission of God. It has been shown, too, that God permits it more in the case of generative powers because of their greater corruption than in the case of other human actions. But concerning the method by which such obstruction is procured, it is to be noted that it does not affect only the generative powers, but also the powers of imagination or fancy. And as to this, Peter of Palud notes five methods, for he says that the devil, being a spirit, has power over a corporeal creature to cause or prevent a local motion. Therefore, he can prevent bodies from approaching each other, either directly or indirectly, by interposing himself in some bodily shape. In this way it happened to the young man who was betrothed to an idol, and nevertheless married a young maiden, and was consequently unable to copulate with her. Secondly, he can excite a man to the act, or freeze his desire for, for it, by the virtue of, a secret, of secret things of which he best knows the power. Thirdly, he can also disturb a man's perception and imagination as to, the, to make the woman appear loathsome to him, since he can as had been said, influence the imagination. Fourthly, he can directly prevent the erection of that member which is adapted to fr fructification. 
just as he can prevent local motion. Fifthly, he can prevent the flow of the vital essence to the members in which lie the motive power, by closing, as it were, the seminary ducts, so that it does not descend to the generative channels, or falls back from them, or does not project from them, or, is, or in any of many ways fails in its function. And he continues, in agreement with what has been treated of above by other doctors, for God allows the devil more latitude in respect of this act, through which sin was first spread abroad, than of, any, of other human acts. Similarly, serpents are more subject to magic spells than are other animals. And a little later he says, It is the same in the case of a woman, for the devil can so darken her understanding that she considers her husband so loathsome that not for all the world would she allow him to lie with her. Later he wishes to find a reason why more men than women are bewitched in respect of that action. And he says that such obstruction generally occurs in the matters of erection, which can more easily happen to men. Therefore, more men than women are bewitched. It might also be said that the greater part of witches being women, they lust more for men than for women. Also, they act in the, dis also they act in the despite of married women, finding every opportunity for adultery when the husband is able to copulate with other women but not with his own wife, and similarly, the wife also has to seek other lovers. He adds also that God allows the devil to afflict sinners more bitterly than the just. Wherefore, the angel said to Tobias, He gives the devil power over those who are given up to lust, but he has power also against the just. Sometimes, as in the case of Job, but not in the respect of the genital functions. Wherefore, they ought to devote themselves to confession and other good works, lest the iron remain in the wound, and it be in vain to apply remedies. So much for Peter. But the method of removing such effects will be shown in the second part of this work. Some incidental doubts on the subject of copulation, prevented by the evil spells, are made clear. But incidentally, if it is asked by this function, is sometimes obstructed in respect of one woman, but not of another, the answer, according to St. Bonaventura, is this. Either the enchantress of which afflicts in this way those persons upon whom the devil has determined, or it is because God will not permit it to be inflicted on certain persons. For the hidden purpose of God is in this is obscure, as is shown in the case of the wife of Tobias. And he adds, If it is asked how the devil does this, it is to be said that he obstructs the genital power not intrinsically by harming the organ, but extrinsically by rendering it useless. Therefore, since it is an artificial and not a natural obstruction, he can make a man impotent towards one woman, but not towards others, by taking away the inflammation of his lust for her, but not for other women, either through his own power, or through some herb or stone, or some occult natural means. And this agrees with the word, words of Peter of Polude. Besides, since impotency in this act is sometimes due to coldness of nature or some natural def defect, it is asked how it is possible to distinguish whether it is due to witchcraft or not. Hostiensius gives the answer in his Summa, but this must not be publicly preached. When the member is in no way stirred and can never perform the act of coition, this is a sign of frigidity of nature. But when it is stirred and becomes erect, but yet cannot perform, it is a sign of witchcraft. It is to be noted also the impotence of the member to perform the act is not the only bewitchment, but sometimes the woman is caused to be unable to conceive, or else she miscarries. Note, moreover, that according to what is a, a down, laid down by the canons, whoever through desire of vengeance or forward hatred does anything to a man or a woman to prevent them from begetting or conceiving must be considered a homicide. And note further that the canon speaks of loose lovers who, to save their mistresses from shame, use contraceptives such as potions or herbs that contravene nature without any help from the devils, and such penitents are to be punished as homicides. But witches who do such things by witchcraft 
or by law punishable by the extreme penalty, as had been touched on above in the first question. And for a solution of the arguments, when it is objected that these things cannot happen to those joined together in matrimony, it is further to be noted that even if the truth in this matter had not already been made sufficiently plain, yet these things can truly and, ha and actually happen, just as much to those who are married as to those who are not. And the prudent reader, who has plenty of books, will refer to the theologians and the canonists, especially where they speak of the impotent and bewitched. You will find them in agreement in condemning two errors, especially with regard to married people, who seem to think that such bewitchment cannot happen to those who are joined in matrimony, advancing the reason that the devil cannot destroy the works of God. And the first error which they condemn is that those who say that there is no witchcraft in the world, but only in the imagination of men who, through their ignorance of hidden causes, which no man yet understands, ascribe certain natural effects to witchcraft, as though they were affected not by hidden causes, but by devils working either by themselves or in conjunction with witches. And although all other doctors condemn this error as pure falsehood, yet St. Thomas impugns it more vigorously and stigmatizes it as actual heresy, saying that this error proceeds from the root of infidelity. And since infidelity in a Christian is accounted heresy, therefore such deserve to be suspected as heretics. And this matter was touched on in the first question, though it was not there declared so plainly. For if any one considers the other sayings of St. Thomas in other places, he will find the reasons why he affirms that such an error proceeds from the root of infidelity. For in his questions concerning sin, there he treats of devils in his first question whether devils have bodies that naturally belong to them. Among many other matters, he makes mention of those who referred every physical effect to the virtue of the stars, to which they said that the hidden causes of terrestrial effects were subject. And he says, it must be considered that the peripatetics, the followers of Aristotle, held that the devils did not really exist, but that those things which are attributed to devils proceeded from the power of the stars and other natural phenomena. Wherefore, St. Augustine says that it was the opinion of Porphyry that from herbs and animals and certain sounds and voice and from figures and figments observed in the motion of the stars, powers and corresponding to the stars were fabricated on earth by men in order to explain various natural effect. And the error of these is plain, since they referred everything to hidden causes in the stars, holding that devils were only fabricated by the imagination of men. But this one is clearly proved to be false by St. Thomas in the same work, for some works of the devils are found which can in no way proceed from any natural cause. For example, when one who is possessed by devil speaks in, in an unknown, unknown language, and many other devil's work are found both in the rap rhapsodic and the necronomic arts, which can in no way proceed except from some intelligence, which may be naturally good, but is evil in its intention. And therefore, because of these incongruities, other philosophers were compelled to admit that there were devils, yet they afterwards fell into various errors some thinking that the souls of men, when they left their bodies, became devils. For this reason, many soothsayers have killed children, that they might have their souls as their cooperators, and many other errors are recounted. From this, it is clear that not without reason does the holy doctor say that such an opinion proceeds from the root of infidelity. And anyone who wishes may read St. Augustine on the various errors of infidels concerning the nature of devils, and indeed, the common opinion of all doctors quoted in the above-mentioned work against those who err in this way by denying that there are any witches is very weighty in its meaning, even if it is expressed in few words. For they say that they who maintain that there is no witchcraft in the world go contrary to the opinion of all doctors in the, of the Holy Scripture and declare that there are devils and that devils have power over the bodies and imaginations of men the permission of God, wherefore those who are instruments of the devils, at whose instance of 
the devil at times do mischief to a creature they call witches. Now, in the doctor's condemnation of the first error, nothing is said concerning those joined together in matrimony. But this may, is made clear in their condemnation of the second error of believing that, though witchcraft exists and abounds in the world, even against carnal copulation, yet, since no such bewitchment can be considered to be permanent, it not, never annuls a marriage that has already been contracted. Here is where they speak of those joined in matrimony. Now in refuting this error, for we do so, even though it is little to the point for the sake of those who have not many books, it is to be noted that they refute it by maintaining that it is against all precedent and contrary to all laws, both ancient and modern. Wherefore, the Catholic doctors make the following distinction. The impotence caused by witchcraft is either temporary or permanent, and if it is temporary, then it does not annul the marriage. Moreover, it is presumed to be temporary if they are, if they are able to be healed of the impediment within three years from their cohabitation, having taken all possible pain either through the sacraments of the church or through other remedies to be cured. But if they are not then cured by any remedy, from that time it is presumed to be permanent. And in that case, it either precedes both the contracting of a marriage and annuls one that is not yet contracted, or else it follows the contract of marriage but precedes its consummation. And then also, according to some, it annuls the previous contract. For it is said in Book 32, Question 1, that the confirmation of a marriage consists in its carnal office. Or else it is subse subsequent to the consummation of the marriage, and then the matrimonial bond is not annulled. Much is noted there concerning impotence by Hostinensis and Godfrey, and the doctors and theologians. To the arguments as to the first, it is made sufficiently clear from what has been said for as to the argument that God's work can be destroyed by the devil's work, if witchcraft has power against those who are married, it has no force. Rather, does the opposite appear, since the devil can do nothing without God's permission. For he does not destroy by main force like a tyrant, but through some extrinsic art, as is proved above. And the second argument is also made quite clear, why God allows this obstruction more in the case of the venereal act than of other acts. But the devil has power also over other acts when God permits. Where, wherefore it is not sound to argue that he could destroy the whole world, and the third objection is similarly answered by what has been said. Thank you, Sabu. Love y'all. All right, so I think I'm gonna stop there. Uh, good stopping place, I think. That's in the middle of part one. There's about ten more questions to read through. Um, I think I, I put it down. If you ever miss any of these and actually want to listen to them, uh, I do publish them on YouTube. So... Hopefully, I haven't actually listened to them myself, so hopefully they transferred well. So, link should be below if you're interested. Uh, everyone who's still there, who hanged out, who listened, thank you, and hopefully I'll see you next week. Have an excellent Monday. <laughs>